So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin our second panel for the day right now. Our panelists discussing starting your own firm and going out on your own, starting from my left and working across to your right and go to the left. We have Bob Simon of the Simon Law Firm, Michelle Ayo Russo next to him of Ayo Russo Dogger, Judge Julie Palafox, Superior Court of California, Ms. Tally Goody of the Goody Law Firm, Mr. Anthony Ellis of Ellis & Bach. Your pe second panel, ladies and gentlemen. Please give them a warm welcome. So we're going to do something a little different than the last panel. We're going to do more of like a TED Talk type situation, um, more interactive. If you have any questions, you can throw them out. But we're gearing this one towards specifically going solo, tips to creating your own solo practice. So you have different types of people up here. They did it differently. So we want to give you some practical tips if you're thinking about doing it, um, maybe some learning tips as we've, you know, the trials and tribulations that we've learned. So I'm going to introduce to you our panelists that we have here today. Spencer Wood did an amazing job. And Spencer, thank you for putting this together. We're going to miss you in the JAG program next year. And I hope you keep the mustache. Don't be afraid, my friend. <laughs> you can do it. So the first person we have here is um, her honor, Judge Julie Palafox, came to us from Orange County. She is the trial judge of the year for family law. She's been in that department, one of the most loved judges. And I think after 30 years of practice as a, as a lawyer in the civil realm. She was appointed by Judge Jerry Brown in 2015. Is that That's right, Your Honor? That's right. And she comes to us, her undergrad, well, Notre Dame, 1980, and then graduated from this fine law school in 1983. So she went from touchdown Jesus to the cross right outside the, uh, the program, which I learned is actually the, the cross theme tower. Is that what it's called? Or the Phillips theme tower for Dean Phillips, so I learned that today. So welcome, thank you for coming, Judge Palafox. Thank you very much, happy to be here. <laughs> and one thing you'll learn about her is she uh, had private practice both as for plaintiff and personal injury when she first started for a small firm in Santa Monica and then did some years on the dark side, the defense side, it's the same thing. Um, she did, but she did have cool corporate clients like Disneyland and the such. It did a mix of a little bit of both before she took the bench. So she's going to give us a wide array of what it was like out there from, from the mid-80s up until the time she was appointed. So thank you for coming. Uh, the next person we have is Tally Goody. So Tally uh, just started her own law firm at the end of last year. So she's going to be able to give us some nuts and bolts, and she does some compliance for other lawyers when they do want to start their own law firm. And you can thank her for the handouts that we have on the left part of our um, what do you call these things, these cool little leather things, whatever. <laughs> but on the side of that, uh, Tally's created a packet, just if you want to go solo, some tips and practices. But uh, Tally comes to us from Palos Verdes. Her parents are both Iranian immigrants. Um, they have instilled with, into her the ability to work, work hard, and to be your own independent person. Um, she went to Thomas Jefferson Law School in San Diego. Uh, we have the pleasure of having her here today. She, after law school, she started, she did three or four years doing um, art transactional law. So if you have any interesting art pieces, Tally can show you how to get them. It's a pretty cool area of practice. So Tally, thank you for coming here today. Round of applause. So the next person here is Michelle Iros or Iruso. I used to have her phone number saved as La Russo because I couldn't really figure it out, but it's E. Russo, and she is with the firm E. Russo and Dagger. Um, you can find her awesome. She may or may not be behind the Instagram handle at Gossip Lawyer, which is one of the funniest trolling accounts. See, Tally didn't even know. It may or may not be. She may or may not be affiliated with it, but it's absolutely hilarious. Um, she is well known as a trial lawyer for the people. She tries all kinds of cases up and down the state of California from employment to catastrophic personal injury. And much to her dismay, we have this moment as trial lawyers whenever we're all amped, ready to try a case, and it starts the next week, and then something happened that happens to Michelle just as early as Thursday as the defense signs her settlement demand, which is, I demand X amount, or you, if you don't pay this, you're going to get stuck with her fees and costs. It's the 998. They just signed it and faxed it over. So it's that bittersweet moment, right, Michelle? <laughs> Very bittersweet. Yeah, and so she... Undergrad, NYU, and then UCLA, UCLA Law School, but I don't think that's where she became the best trial lawyer that she is today. The reason she resonates so well with people is because she was a bartender in New York for 10 years before being going to law school. So I always tell people, who makes great trial lawyers? People that work in the service industry, because you get to talk to people, and that's what you do during jury selection in the trial. So Michelle, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. So 
So last and certainly least, I mean, not least, but you know, um, Anthony is, I met Anthony because he was a preceptor in the preceptor program and he was my mentee way back in the day. Um, Anthony, we met at Pepperdine and he worked for my firm for, for several years and then went out on his own practice and he's gonna be able to share with you what it's like to go from a firm like ours where we do a lot of trial practice, how he was able to establish himself as a trial lawyer and Anthony, he tried his first case two months out of coming out of law school here at Pepperdine. So he's gonna show you how it's able to have early success and then to start your own practice and kind of the trials and tribulations that you have. And he's with the firm of Ellis and Bach and they are in Sherman Oaks, so they're very local here. And he met his law partner in law school as well, and they've always had the plan to be able to do something like this. So he's gonna share with you, and he has been out how many years now, Anthony, with your practice, your partner? Two. Two years. Just what, in two short years, where you can go, and kind of the things, and just the growing pains that you have to get through. So, Anthony, thank you for coming here, my friend. Uh, we'll skip that guy. Uh, my Instagram handle is at Planet Fun Bob, but you have to be over 18 to look. Yeah. Um, so Tally helped put together some law, just law firm formation stuff for people that are thinking about it. Because a lot of us, for me, I waited four or three years after I graduated law school doing private before I started my own firm in 2010. So I've been in mine, one from just me to now we have 22 lawyers in 10 years. I'd like to get that back down to one though, if we could do it right. So just kidding. Tally, why don't you uh, right. okay. give us some knowledge? So um, as Bob says, you guys have these checklists in your um, folders. And this is a really great reference for you to look at when, you're, when you do decide what kind of entity you want to form. And it says basically step by step what you need to do. So you can look at it now, save it for later. Um, but the whole purpose of formally creating your own law firm entity is to help um, protect you from liabilities and also it can help you save on taxes. So um, you may wanna know what, how can you choose your best, um, the, the best entity for your firm? There are a lot of different options. There's uh, professional corporations, there's LLPs, sole proprietorships, um, and there are a few factors to consider when making that decision. Uh, some of those factors include tax consequences, um, liability protection, as well as your firm structure. So we'll move to firm structure. Before so, we do that, Tally, though, yeah. just I'm curious on this particular panel. All of us have our, <clears throat> all of us have or had our own practices. Anthony, which uh, which uh, structure did you pick? I have an LLP. Okay, Tally. And I'm an LLP as well. And when I was in my solo practice, I was an S corporation. Michelle, general partnership. Dangerous. <laughs> I have a professional corporation, and then I have my firm and LLP over top of that. Very good. So it's a shell a, game. There's, there's a lot of companies to, in the Caribbean. <laughs> there's a lot to consider with respect, and you can see our, our panel. We all chose different paths. And how about you, Your Honor? What What were you? No, I said that. S Corp. S Corp. See, I was. I was testing them. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. So um, back to the firm structure. So it's gonna really depend on how you like to work. Do you like to work on your own or do you like to partner up with a few colleagues or some friends? So that's gonna help really narrow down the options that you can actually choose once you decide that. So for example, if you are gonna be working on your own and maybe have a couple employees, you can choose to be a sole proprietorship or you can be a professional corporation, which is a very popular option. Um, on the other hand, we have, when you have two or more attorneys, you can either be a limited liability partnership as well as a professional corporation and a general partnership. Um, keep in mind, LLCs cannot practice law in, in California. So from these options, LLPs and professional corporations are the most desirable usually because they will help um, protect an attorney from shareholder or partner malpractice and other business related liabilities. And like I said before, can help you save on taxes. So that's the firm structure. So now we come to kind of the fun part, choosing your firm name. Um, and you have to, there are a lot of different rules you have to follow to make sure that your name is gonna pass under the Secretary of State as well as the State Bar. Um, 
So just a couple examples, if you're going to be a professional corporation, it could be Smith and Joan, you have to add either the letters PC at the end or APC or actually write out professional corporation. So there are a lot of different rules. You can look into that when you're ready to create your own firm. Um, you also don't want to be really misleading with your name and also want to make sure it's available with the Secretary of State. And, and I looked at some other names you may want to avoid because I saw your, your law firm fail here. And these are actual law firm names that, and I know two of these are in California. One is Pain and Fears, it's true. <laughs> this one's one in San Francisco, it's called Low Ball and Lynch. Mm. <laughs> Another one is Wiener and Cox. <laughs> yeah. Another one, Slaughter and Slaughter. I know that one too. So you might want to. So I came out some good ones for the people on the panel, and I can't find one for Judge Palifax. She had a partner who the partner would be. So if the audience can help me, just think about it. But I had for um, Anthony, if you had another partner, maybe Johnny Island, it'd be Ellis Island. You could do immigration law. I think that'd be cool. <laughs> um, there's so many good ones for Goody. I mean, I could go over the map, but um, I have a lawyer that we very close to, a friend of yours, you know, um, Sienna Boutte. So I think Goody Booty would be pretty good. <laughs> and you, you obviously would do sexual harassment, right? Um, and then for, since I originally had your, your name is LaRusso, I think LaRusso and Miyagi, yeah. and you guys could do martial arts law. So that, that's a throwback to the 80s joke, by the way. But let's think of one for Judge Palifax, because I couldn't come up with anything other than Halifax, Canada, but I mean. No, I actually can tell you a very good one. <laughs> My husband um, is a part-time musician, and he never told me when we first got married that he did this, so he, he didn't disclose that. Um, <laughs> but he has a stage name, and his stage name is Nick Justice. Wow. And what I learned when he had this stage name was, Oh my gosh, I could have been Julie Justice. You should have just told me that name. So that's what I would have used had yeah. I known about it. And now I know too many lawyers that are naming their kids Justice. Like it's the new thing, middle name. That's cool, I guess. Uh, but in my firm, we're the Simon Law Group, but we rebranded as the Justice Team, so everything's justiceteam.com, because you also have to think about that when you're starting a law firm. How are you going to market yourself? We'll talk about marketing in a little bit. How are you going to get clients? Who are you looking for? Like, what's easier to resonate with customers? And sometimes names are hard to do. If you have like four names on the door, who's going to be able to remember that? So you have to think about those types of things when your name, because it is very important. What you register yourself with is the state bar, is the entity you can later advertise and do as. So when you're thinking about these, you have to think five, 10 years down the road. All right, Tally, next one's for you. All right, so there are a couple of major hoops you have to go through in order to be um, in compliance in the state of California. And the first one is you have to register with the California Secretary of State. So if you're going to be a professional corporation, you need to file an Articles of Incorporation. If you're going to be a limited liability partnership, you have to file a registration as well. Um, okay, and the next hoop you have to go through is registering your firm with the California State Bar. Um, and something to think about, keep in mind that when you do form your name with the California Secretary of State and everything is good, you, it comes back filed, it's proper, there is a chance that you could still run into issues when you apply with the California State Bar because they are a little bit more specific. Um, they might say your name is misleading or it doesn't match your firm structure. So you really want to make sure you're, you know, looking through all the rules and um, ensuring that you're in compliance with all of them. And then um, there are also some other requirements that you'll have to do. Um, you'll have to obtain an employer identification number with the IRS. Uh, you will have to register to pay taxes on the state level and the, um, the federal level. And just a little tip for professional corporations, um, S-corporations are very beneficial because if you elect to be an S-corp, you are basically kind of identifying as a pass-through entity, which means you don't really have to pay um, income taxes on a corporate level, just on an individual level. So that will really help you save uh, money if you're gonna be a small firm. And then you also need to open up a business banking account. Nope. Oh. <laughs> a business banking account is very important. No matter your firm structure, you don't want to commingle your funds. So you want to keep your personal funds separate from your business funds. 
and you want to open up a client trust account. Very, very important. No matter the type of law you're practicing, whether it's billable hours or contingent, you're gonna need a client trust account to keep everything separate. And last but not least, you need malpractice insurance. No matter what, you also need that. So that's Yeah, with question. the malpractice insurance, you're actually um, ethically obligated if you do not have it to tell the client that in your retainer agreement. And if you do not tell them, it could eviscerate your entire fee. So be very careful, even if you're referring it to another client, a case came down this week that says if you do not ethically disclose, if you don't have insurance and you refer a case to somebody else, that could eviscerate their referral percentage too. Michelle's eyes I just lit up. She's like, you mean I can not pay people referral fees? <laughs> but, uh, we'll talk about that because it's another marketing opportunity uh, for you. So now we're going to move over and we're going to pivot a little bit. We're going to talk about how everybody got started, why they got started the way that they did. Um, one thing I did when I got started is I picked the perfect partner. And sometimes it's hard to find partners that are somebody that you trust with your life, that think like you do and act like you do. I was, I mean, but my parents had twins, so it was pretty cool. I had a clone that was just like me, and this is us, and there's probably two 19, of you. there's two of us. There's actually three. There's another one that's like a few years younger, but we go to court and pretend to be the other person all the time. It's pretty cool. So, uh, but anyways, it's, it's critical to find somebody. Uh, when you're running, when you're running your own law firm, you're also running a business, and you have to keep that always on, in the back of your mind because you think you can go out there, you can go to court, you can do X, Y, Z. If you're starting your own firm, more than 50% of your time is operating a business. You're doing compliance, you're doing eventually payroll, human resources, you're doing all these other things. My brother decided he'd take a back seat, mostly because I made him. I'm six minutes earlier, so whatever. <laughs> so he he runs the business and he always has. And I was able to go out and do the trials, the depositions, and things like this. But you have to think about that and have somebody you absolutely trust because you hear too often that once money starts to get involved, it changes friendships and things. So always keep that in the back of your mind. So first I'm going to ask Michelle, how did you pick your partner? Because you were on your own for three or so years before you partnered up with Nick. Yeah. Just kind of walk us through that decision process and why. It was really easy. I, I did a three-week trial um, down at Stanley Mosque. It was my first employment trial, $750,000 verdict. Um, but I came back after three weeks, and my office was in disarray. I was like, I can't do this. Yeah. And I was on my own, and I needed somebody. So my partner and I had mutual friends through um, somebody that I had gone to law school with, and his partnership had, has, had dissolved. He lost his trial attorney. He doesn't do trials. Um, he doesn't you know, take a lot of depots. He did, mostly defends depots, does mediation, and plays good cop to my bad cop. So it was just a natural, yeah, coming yeah. together. And, and how about you, Your Honor? Um, well, I started out uh, in, a, in a plaintiff's personal injury practice, uh, then I, in Santa Monica, then moved to Santa Ana and found a very similar practice, except that practice did mostly defense, as I said. But it was small, between 10 and 15 lawyers. I did that for 15 years, and then one day I woke up and said I could do better. And what I meant by that was I could do better balancing my work life and my um, home life. I had three children by that time, and um, my husband worked in San Francisco. So it was a little complicated. And I decided if I became a sole practitioner, I could pick and choose what I, um, my clients and my cases, and by that time, it was in the, it was actually the year 2000. You could say to uh, the uh, other counsel when you were scheduling depositions, or you could say to a judge, I'm not available, I have to take my, um, it's my son's uh, you know, Christmas program. And you know what, for the most part, people would very much cooperate with you if you gave them a heads up. Mm -hmm. So I was able to just pick and choose and, uh, I decided to work for myself, and uh, I did that for 15 years, and it was great. Loved it. So you're, why did you decide to, uh, to elevate to the bench? Well, I did that. Well, actually, when I received my bar dues one day, um, I looked at the year that I had graduated, which was 1983, 83. and um, my claim to fame is I went to law school with Rick Caruso, <laughs> and I did not know Rick Caruso that well, or actually I just didn't pay too much attention to him, and I think I should have paid more attention to him in law school, um, because he's done wildly successful, and he's a great, wonderful, um, charitable person, and um, that could be any of you sitting out there. But um, uh, I, uh, what was your question? 
Why'd you elevate to the bar? <laughs> oh, the because bench? I looked at I'd been practicing law for 30 years, and I'd done it as uh, 15 years as a plaintiff's attorney. I did about, uh, five, well, no, I did 15 years each side, plaintiff and defense. And as a sole practitioner, I had a little uh, handful of defense clients, big defense clients. Um, I did a lot of work for Disneyland, self-insured. And then I also had the plaintiff clients, which were unfortunately not the big, big dollar clients, but there's a lot of little people that get injured too. And a lot of little people can uh, bring you great success as well. You don't always have to be looking for the giant verdicts. If you, if you settle cases for fifty to $100,000 regularly, you've got a very good income. And we'll so, talk about this on the marketing side, but a lot of my biggest cases came from helping people on the smaller cases and, exactly. often, and often for free. Exactly. And they remember and they come back. But the, but the long and short of it was I felt I'd done it for 30 years and I thought I needed to do just something more. And on a whim, I uh, put in an application to be a judicial uh, officer never in a million years expecting to be called because I was a solo practitioner, okay? Not big name, marquee, known to uh, the power players that handle these types of things, but uh, I did. I got that phone call, and my biggest regret is not doing it sooner. Mm -hmm. So a little uh, uh, push for the judiciary. All you need to do is practice 10 years and then you can put in an application. It's, uh, it's really, the view from the bench is, uh, it's great. Watching all of you guys perform is just so entertaining. <laughs> um, it, good trial lawyering is like watching the Super Bowl. So um, it's wonderful, and that's why I did it. Well, I but I loved my solo practice. Loved, loved, loved it. It's a great way to balance work and family. <coughs> And um, being a judge is a civil servant job. I mean, it is, you're, you are a civil servant and it takes a lot to get, it's, you're giving back. You don't, you're not doing it, in my opinion, for the money or the glory. It's you are giving back to the profession of the legal system. And I do think that the Orange County bench is one of the best benches in the state of California. So thank you for thank taking you. that sacrifice, Your Honor. Um, Tally, how did you get started and why? All right. So. Um like Bob mentioned, I started working in Century City. I was working at a boutique law firm uh, doing art law. And this included art transactions, um, some art litigation. And, you know, I, it was a nice job. It was comfortable. I, you know, I enjoyed, um, my boss was really great. And it was, it was a good job. I learned a lot, but I also felt really stagnant. I just felt like I, I wasn't really, um, you know, learning, I kind of felt like I just hit my ceiling where I couldn't um, grow anymore. And I really wanted to challenge myself and I wanted to switch uh, the areas of law that I was working because I, my husband is actually, um, he does personal injury and he's a victim advocate. And it was very kind of inspiring for me that he makes a difference in so many people's lives. And I was like, you know what? I think I need to do this. I need to, I need to switch it up. I need to challenge myself and feel more fulfilled. And I did, and, and I just started my own firm four months ago, so I'm very fresh, um, and it's, it's great. I'm really enjoying it. It's challenging, but I am very happy that I made this decision. Oh, and I was also commuting like an hour and a half each way, so that was a big factor, and I was like, I gotta stop this. It's just, you know, work-life balance is horrible. I would, I would leave my house at like five in the morning, I'd get back at, seven like i didn't really have a life monday through friday it was just you know but now i have my time i can balance um and i'm doing what i enjoy so it's and great and you got a new puppy oh i just got a new puppy so it's like a baby i have, <laughs> I have a baby at home <laughs> but it, it's good it's it's great do you know the name of your puppy oh good one do you know how do you know the name yeah. of the puppy all right <laughs> anthony why don't you give us uh um so i I partner up with a classmate of mine from Pepperdine. Um, what we, year did you graduate, Anthony? Uh, 2015. Nice. Uh, law is my second career. I was a business broker first, so uh, got into Pepperdine. Met Bob um, through the preceptor program. He became my mentor. I probably lucked out. I was actually telling him we were at a seminar before, and I texted him. I was like, you know, a lot of uh, these people here might not get the opportunity I got. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a great opportunity. My partner, Jonathan, he went to Pepperdine, too. He went off to a big firm. I clerked for Bob, ended up... Uh, being an attorney for them. 
And um, we kind of learned different ways. I learned trial by fire, which Bob told me from the beginning, you come, I'm throwing you in. So I had depots, trials within the first you know, week I was doing depots. Uh, my partner went the different route. He kind of worked his way up. So he got to fill in all the little dots and he's a great law and motion guy. And I love trial and just jumping in the fire and shooting from the hip. So uh, you got to find your partner's superpower. You, everybody has a superpower, and if you're lucky enough, your superpower is something you actually like doing. <laughs> um, we both had that. We found it, so we meshed. Also, along the way, we always stayed in contact, never really um, talking much about uh, other than about the cases we have. And, you know, we kind of learned that we have the same, you know, morals and virtues, and we see clients the same way, and it just made sense. You know, he saw money, how he wants his firm to be, how he wants to treat his clients the same way. So it just totally made sense. Probably one of the hardest decisions I made leaving the, um, the Simon Law Group, but we jumped in, man, and it was great. Yeah, I was still, people always ask, you know, when is the right time to do my own thing or, you know, how should I do things? I always tell people, find, what is it you want to do and what is it you want to do most of the time and find a way to do that. Some people want to just, some people like to write motions and appeals and do appellate arguments. Some people like to litigate and drive traffic. Some people like being in the courtroom. Some people like generating business. And if you should find, I say 80% of your day should be doing what you love to do. And if you're not on a, on a track to do it, you're doing the wrong thing. Because I don't think it exists anymore why you need to work at a big firm and pay your dues. Because there's so many resources out there that we're going to talk about in a second that allow you to do all of those things. So I'm going to next pose to you books that you're reading that you've read. Let's just name them because I think it's always very helpful. Whenever I was in law school, things that I read that inspired me or books that helped me practically. I listed a few here of one, You Can't Teach Hungry by John Morgan. He has a mega firm. They're all over the south, uh, southeast. Um, this is about starting your own practice and how you're having it grow. He has another one called You Can't Teach a Vision that just came out. These are just very good books just to learn nuts and bolts things. Some other ones are, well, let's ask our panelists, what are some books that you've read or ones that you've helped you throughout your practice of law that are good for anybody that are here? I would just start with this California State Bar. They actually have um, a book on how to open your own law practice. And it's a wealth of information and use it as a template. So that's what I did and I know it's gotten even better. So I'd start there. I would, oh sorry. Uh, I just, I had to look at my Amazon. I just got this book, it's really good. Um, if you're gonna be working with people who have trauma, um, personal injury, I also do employment, so a lot of my people have gone through trauma. Um, there's a really great book called The Body Keeps Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. I really recommend that. Anthony? The classic uh, Rules of the Road by Rick Friedman. I mean, if, you're, if you want to be a trial attorney, you want to get up there and tell your client's story, it lays it out for you. Yeah, and if you watch Spencer Lucas and whenever, I mean, whenever they were going over their opening, they used, I could tell, Rules of the Road to frame it. <laughs> talk about the rules that were broken, so very powerful book. All right, and one that I got for um, for basically how to even just, you know, everything you need to know for um, opening your own firm is how to start and build a law practice. Um, that one <coughs> is by, let's see, who is it? J.G. Foonberg, and it's really great. It, I mean, it just lays everything out. It's um, it's been around for a while, and um, yeah, I mean, it really, it, I haven't read the whole thing, to be honest with you, but it's, it has, you know, it goes through everything, and it has, every, you know, it, it's helpful, so I would suggest that. So the next one I have slide is called Where to Start, and I, I kind of think there's three. If you want to get into trial practice or have your own shop eventually, there's three key places to do it. One, you can go start at the DA's office or public defenders. You're going to get a ton of trial experiences out the gate. The other one is to open up your shop, your own shop is what we're talking about here today. The other one is to go work for big law and pay your dues and things like this. Um, I think the last one's going the way of the dodo bird because I think with the resources out there and this collective that you can build and what's out there for us, to, everybody to see, you don't need to do that anymore. I think it's a big misnomer. Um, and I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks about um, these three different career paths and what you would take. And by the way, everybody, I, I believe, every up here on this panel did not come from money. We didn't have seed money to start our own firms. It was all, we're all in law school debt, heavy law school debt, and found a way to make it happen. Michelle's laughing, but uh, <laughs> more than you probably would know, but um, it just shows you that you don't need to have family money or to open up a big, take a big nut from a bank to be able to get started. You can absolutely do it. Um, so 
Michelle, do you want anything you want to share? Because you thought it was so funny calling on you. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I graduated the class of 2011, and a bunch of us didn't get jobs. We were like the, I, I think like 50% of us in 2011, like across the country, didn't get jobs. Um, so I went to work for a small firm. That firm imploded, and I just had no choice. I could either take a job that I knew wasn't going to pay my bills, or I could open up my own shop. And doing plaintiff's work, um, like her honor said, you know, the small cases were not only like super satisfying, but that's what like kept me going. It's your bread and butter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So how, how long was it after you graduated before you opened your own practice? Um, so I got my bar card in December of 2011 and I started my own practice in about, I want to say June of 2013. Okay. That's yeah. soon. So, yeah. I took the long route. I was in, um, I was in, uh, worked in a two, three different law firms over 15 years. So I think that's the long route to uh, starting your own practice. The, the good part of that was I had a steady income. And then when I decided to do it, I was able to plan enough that I was able to put aside my seed money. I opened my own practice with uh, $25,000. Mm -hmm. So that, that got me out the door. One thing I also did, if you choose to go this route where you go to a big firm or a small firm, but you go to a firm, you, you're a W-2 employee, is exit gracefully. And what I mean by that is let the people you work, work with know you're planning to do this. Because if you do, they won't be shocked and they'll actually be supportive, supportive of you. Um, they might even let you take some of your clients, which I did, and then they're a great source of referral, and if you're a solo practice attorney, then you can use them to make appearances for you when you can't be in two yeah. places at once. So that, that way worked out well. And when Anthony left our firm, I gave him dozens of slip and falls at Disneyland. <laughs> wonderful cases. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still burning. Did you win no. any of those? <laughs> no, actually, when I, when, <laughs> we just keep pushing trial, hoping. <laughs> no, actually, when I left, uh, you know, I talked to Bob. It was kind of, I said it was a hard decision. You know, I sat down with Bob and. If you're lucky enough to have a boss like that, I mean, he said, keep your office. What do you need? Set me up with things. Um, it's been amazing. Introduce me to people. So he kind of helped me. And I think if you if you work at a firm first and you put in the work and you're respectful and you appreciate what you've been given and, um, you know, like your honor say, don't just burn bridges, you'll be surprised, um, you know, the love you'll get when you're ready to go out. And that's that can make the biggest difference. And uh to talk very briefly about just nuts and bolts things you need to get started. So I did this slide for, we got phone lines, office space, and seed money. So I want to talk to uh, Anthony first. What are you doing for these solutions this day and age, most cost effective? So you got to start small, as small as you can. What I, mean, what I mean by small is if you don't need a lot of these things, with technology now, I mean, you could have digital phone service for dirt cheap, you know, they have virtual offices. Um, I mean, a group of really smart attorneys and people got together and made a, something called Justice HQ that you could look into. Um, there's, there, there's so much there for you. We started out really small, small, you know, small printer, and then we grew into it. Uh, that's the way to do it. A lot of people don't feel like they're an attorney or they're the boss unless they have a big office and they can walk in. And it's completely, I, I feel the opposite. You build up to it and then that office, once you've deserved it and you can maintain it, um, It'll, it'll make more sense, you'll appreciate it more. Plus, if you're planning on being a litigator, um, costs come out of nowhere. Uh, you could dump thousands, tens of thousands, if not more, into a case. You could be handed a great case, but you need 80,000 to try it in about three months. So war chest, keep it going, all the other stuff, minimal, as minimal as possible. Tally? Yeah, so um, keeping your overhead as low as possible when you're first starting out is very important. Um, I have a virtual office currently. I don't actually go work there, but um, I work at home and, you know, I go pick up my mail from there. And now I'm actually a member of Justice HQ as well. Um, and in that, we're going to have office space come up. You can look into Justice HQ. I won't get into that. But um, it's, it's good to just keep everything at a low cost. And I do have the same phone service that's just like connected to my cell phone. It's a business line. Um, 
yeah, everything is low cost right now for me. Yeah, I think people would be shocked how inexpensive it is to start your own yeah. your own shop. Mm-hmm. Even what, 10 years ago was more expensive because these solutions didn't exist. I would add to that, um, make sure when you when you go out on your own that you know how to do everything yourself. If you've been in a firm and you're used to having assistants, you're used to having secretaries, go uh, look over their shoulders and learn everything they know before you go out yourself. Um, When I went to law school way back then, uh, well, we actually had a library and books that we read. Uh, We read the cases and books. We didn't have computers back then. So it it was the, uh, we started with uh, the old, big, gigantic room computers. But eventually, by the time you get out and you can practice law now with your own laptop, you should be able to do anything. And with judicial counsel forms, there's a form for everything. Learn how to fill it out. Learn how to file. Your overhead is so low because you're doing it all yourself. So um, that's, that's a secret. Make sure you know multiple, multiple skills. Michelle, how about you? Keep a low overhead. Ring central. Um, I can text, call, get faxes, goes to my cell phone. Um, I use HelloFax as well. Um, my office also uses a Google Suite. So um, I'm often not in the office. I'm often traveling. Everything gets scanned at the office. It gets uploaded to the, <coughs> to the G drive. I can see all the day's mail. If I need to pull a file, I can pull a file. And um, the cool thing with Google and to protect your client information, if I lose my phone, there's a kill switch. Uh, my phone, all my devices can be wiped remotely so that I keep um, client confidences. And one of the big things people think about is what what amount of money or seed money do you need to actually start your firm? And Her Honor talked about having 25000 to start. Um, there's many resources out there. You, you can find partners on other cases. If you get a big case, you can partner with other firms. That's how I started, where they will front the costs for you in exchange for them associating you in so you can learn, giving them a percentage of the fee. If you are out there and you're actually able to get the case, you'll find out having the case is king, and you can kind of dictate and call your own shots from there. So don't be intimidated by what the cost of things are. And hey, at the end of the day, what's the worst thing that could happen? You fail? Well, so what? There's so many more opportunities that are out there for you. There's, um, there's always lessons in, in, yep. in loss as well, so you're never a failure. I agree. And here's some support. So here's some organizations that will help you abundantly, and they're not expensive to join. Um, Cala, Consumer Attorneys of Los Angeles, they have listservs, and I use that when I want on mine, on my own, as my associate panel. I pose questions to the group, and there are thousands of lawyers, well-known lawyers, like Spencer Lucas is on there, he was just here. They'll answer your questions about anything. You don't even need Westlaw. Sorry, Westlaw, if you're here sponsoring, but you don't need them, because I just get any brief there from the listserv, and I ask them, they have a document bank. Same thing with OCTLA, that's the Orange County branch. There's a Los Angeles Child Lawyer Charities, and they do a lot of just charitable work in the community. And I think a lot of us here are members there, but you meet so many people there going out to help paint houses at the Venice like Youth Clinic, all these types of things that help you generate business. Same thing with the Consumer Attorneys of California, San Diego, Justice HQ. These are support systems you have that are out there that are, mar- that are marginal costs that help you accelerate your career and give you a whole platform of people to work with and work together. Um, Consumer attorneys of Cal. Yes, so go ahead, Michelle. I just wanted to say one thing. So I can't, I can't overestimate how important it is to like make connections when you're a young attorney. I was lucky enough to meet Bob through Cala, um, and I did. I remember I was in a trial and I got, I got hit with Sabrosa, and I'm literally sitting there at counsel table and I'm like, Bob, what do I do? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So those connections are really, really important. Yeah, and you, you'll find not only on these listservs and things, but we've elevated that too. At our firm, we use chat rooms, real-time chat rooms, Slack channels, and there are so many attorneys on there that will help you in real time. You're in a deposition, you have an issue. People just respond with the chat going back and forth. And it's very valuable if you're out there on the practice because you'll learn the more you know, the more you realize you don't know, right? And the more stuff you can expand to. Um, so just a wealth of information. So they have, and there's all kind of, there's so many conferences every single month that you go to that are not only fun, but you meet people, and it's a wealth of practical information. Cala has ones, COAC. If you email any one of us up here, we'll send you calendars of all the things we think are the marquee events to go to. And the one thing important to remember always, and Her Honor touched on this, is when you, when you leave that place of employment, um, keep your contacts there, be civil about it, keep your head held high, because those people help you get cases. And civility, I get most of my best cases from lawyers on the other side, mm-hmm. and from judges because they're impressed with your work product and you do it the right way. 
actually your adversaries are one of they were one of my biggest source of, of clients um, because I was just very respectful to them and so when they didn't uh, they had a family member that had some type of injury or uh, um, an associate I would get those calls from them so actually work on relationship with the uh, the opposing counsel you you yeah. would believe won't believe how beneficial that'll be in the case you're handling as well as the future. So Anthony, how are you um, generating cases when you just started your practice two years ago? Um, so how are you doing? We, we actually, we're a bit of an oddball firm. We don't do any marketing, like direct marketing or anything like that. Um, it's just word of mouth and referrals. And it kind of has to do with your honor, what your honor said is we both, me and Jonathan built a good reputation out there while we were at our other firms. Um, so we get referrals. Uh, we, you know, look, your network starts, it started years ago, but if you want to start it, it starts now. The people sitting next to you will refer you cases. They'll be on the other side of the table from you. Um, defense attorneys um, on the other side, I'm a plaintiff's attorney that I went up against. Um, I mean, I was always nice. You advocate for your client, but you're nice. You're not a jerk about it. You don't try to do things you don't have to. It's not a battle. And those are the people you'll deal with later, and they do refer us cases. Mm -hmm. But the main thing is just be a good person. Uh, take care of your clients. We waive fees sometimes, um, and it'll come back. They'll come back to you with families. They'll keep you busy. Um, respect people that refer you cases, handle the cases, you know, like you would handle your own cases, like it was your family's case. That goes a long way. I think that's more valuable than any kind of marketing you could do, and that's how we've been getting our cases. Uh, Tally, how about you? New firm, just two, two, three months? Yeah, so new firm, but um, luckily I've had a lot of friends refer me cases. I, I was very blown away by the amount of support that I receive with people sending me cases like, hey, this is in your area, you want to take it? I'm like, okay, you know, I kind of just threw myself in there. Um, and one advice that I can give you guys is do not um, overly advertise yourself until you're, you know, you got your whole firm structure set up. You know, you don't want to be on bill, billboards until <laughs> you really got a good support team because you're going to be getting a lot of calls. Um, so, you know, make sure your firm structure is set up before you fully, fully market. Um, but yeah, be a good person, like Anthony said, is so important. The connections you make everywhere, you never know it's going to help you in the future. You're going to be like, oh, I remember that person, and then they'll send you a case, you know, so... Michelle, judge. Oh, so we, we don't advertise either. Uh, we do have Gossip Lawyer on Instagram, but that's really just fun. Um, so <laughs> It is you. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> it's us. Um, so we, I, I do employment and personal injury. The employment is, they're both all referral. Um, but with a personal injury, I'm willing to take anything to trial. I've gone to trial over $2,500. And so people know that. And so they come and they're like, hey, can you take this? And we're like, sure. Yeah. Uh, we don't do any advertising either. I just call it marketing. I think the person touch of things, you go out to dinner with somebody, you go out to drinks, and um, that's the best way to build a network and be good to people. I think if you're known as being a good person and take caring people to a fault, it'll always come back to you. Um, but when I was in law school, I used to have a business card that just had my name on it, didn't have a title. I don't know if that's ethical or not, but uh, I used to go, and when I go to restaurants or bars, everybody knew what I did and what I was aspired to do. So I was bringing in cases while I was in law school, and then I met a lot of People in the industry, I always think, what is your intermediary market? For me, it's orthopedic doctors, chiropractors, other lawyers, people that can give you a lot of cases because they have a lot of people walking through the door. Um, I found out where those trauma surgeons at Cedars went for drinks after surgery, and hey, I just happened to be there. And hey, we're best <laughs> friends now. Um, but these types of things, I mean, these relationships you build, you just have to think about it, just be able to generate that type of business. List serves are great. So some of the other books, and um, Anthony mentioned this one, Rules of the Road by Rick Friedman, amazing book. Um, I have it in my car. Yeah. I, got the, I got the CD and I played it in my car and over and over. And I listen. look, when you're traveling an hour and a half, two hours to take yep. a depot, what are you going to do? You know, it's the best thing. Just get a book you like, pop it in your car. And my car had a CD player back there. So hard for trial work. This one called The Reptiles and Psychology, a trial. It's fascinating. Um, the Reptile Bois Deer, that's also good. Polarizing the Case, the one by Rick Friedman. These are all excellent things when you get to trial practice as you get there. Um, Jerry Spence, a well-known trial lawyer, how to argue and win your case every time. So there's, this is the other way when you're partnering with other firms, and this is how I started when I didn't have enough seed money or these cases were too big or too expensive. I brought in, like Spencer Lucas's firm is Panache and Boyle. Um, we have another speaker here from Green Broilet, and I think she's last. So we used to partner with their firms and my mentor, Gary Dorick, other people that they would not only teach me how to run these cases that I had, but they would fund the case for us, and I tried 
my first year out, I think three cases, one with Gary Dordick, two with Brian Panish, and I learned so much, and I stole so much of their stuff <laughs> that uh, it kind of made my career, but they, they got a better result for the client, and while I gave away half of the fee to these other lawyers, it, it accelerated my career like you just wouldn't believe. So don't be afraid if you don't have the money to fund these cases that you get them. Opportunities are out there, and there's way, creative ways to get to the finish line. Um, so we talked a little bit about networking. So uh, Tally, what are some organizations that you belong to that you help generate cases now? Um, so I belong to uh, Justice Headquarters, and um, it's just getting started. We're gonna be going into the building in downtown Los Angeles soon, but basically Justice HQ is very helpful in uh, also providing cases for you. Um, you meet people that are you know on the same level as you, uh, you can get advice from other people, and yeah, it's a it's a great. I mean, we're all getting started, so it's it's a good organization to look into. Um, and yeah. And Anthony, you're um, you're the litigation chair of the San Fernando San Fernando Valley Bar Association. Has that helped you generate cases, and why do that? It does. It does. I um, because I'm, so the litigation uh, section of the San Fernando Valley Bar Association. It's contract law, workers' comp. It's every type of law that litigates. So. Uh, we're kind of in charge of setting up programs and CLE credits and seminars. Um, so you get to meet all these attorneys. And when you're out there, they'll ask, you know, somebody that has a personal injury case will bring it to you. They'll have questions. And there's it's, it's the best way. You get out there and meet attorneys. You can help each other. Um, get your name out there. You get your firm out there. And it, it, it's, it's awesome. They'll come to you with questions. They'll refer case. We refer cases to each other all the time. So you get a network of people to refer cases to. But just get involved. Um, give back. And that'll work. Yeah. And Michelle, we met at a networking one for Cala, right? Yeah. 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 So what other networking things do you do that you can, can you generate a lot of business just by being a nice, smiley person, right? That yeah. People I, work with. <laughs> but um, she's, a, she's a cutthroat in the courtroom. Make no mistake <laughs> about it. She dresses like very prim and proper, but then <laughs> she'll watch you bleed out in the middle of the courtroom. But <laughs> Don't give away all my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually do a lot of networking um, in Pasadena, where I am. Uh, there is a bar that I go to. Um, Dale Gallipo goes there. Oh, nice. um, there's a whole bunch of other lawyers that go there, and other than Dale, they don't do what what I do. So I get a lot of business just from around town. Yeah, it, it'd be. I mean, a lot of these lawyers that. Um, I mean, we. I probably refer out hundreds of cases every year just because we can't handle them, or they're not worth our level, or they're not our expertise. So make friends with other lawyers. You'd be shocked at what they'll be able to throw back to you. Um, and Your Honor, how about for those 30 years that you were, well, the 15 years you were in private practice, how were you able, what did you do to, to get business? Well, uh, as I said, the, uh, the, the uh, adversary was a great source of business. Uh, my, my prior counsel was a great source of business. Being involved in a bar association is a great source of business. But I'm going to actually suggest you take it closer to home. Take it to your own communities, your your little neighborhood. Your neighbors are a great source of business. Mm. Your dentist is a great source of business. Your children's teachers are a great source of business. The people you go to church with, mm. it, they're just right there. And I think the key is whether you're networking in a bar where they serve alcohol. or This is a dry campus, Your Honor. Networking in a bar where um, there's other it's lawyers. restaurants. Or you're networking in your community. Mm -hmm. It's just about relationships. That's what it is. Shake people's hands. Tell them what you do. Be authentic. That's, and and everybody, nobody, like people that aren't lawyers don't know what type of law you do, nor do they care. They just know that you're a lawyer and you could probably help them with their problem. I get text messages every single day from people I met 20 years ago that still have my cell about a legal question. And if I don't do it, I refer them somewhere else. Um, but I think that's very important to be able to maintain those relationships. So I think we're going to end on two things. One, something else Anthony mentioned that I do in the car. I know he does. When you have dead time, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I do listen to Rules of the Road as well, other books, things that help you learn as you go. Um, there's a lot of podcasts that we're listening to that are practical ones. Uh, we have a podcast we run at our firm. Other people do a lot of them. So just get out there, see what's available, because you can listen in the car for free and get advice on how to start your own law firm and things like this. So the thing I want to pose to everybody here are some, what, since we'll do this the last five minutes, so in a couple of words, what is the biggest mistake that you think that you've made since you started your practice? <laughs> Anthony, I'll, you start. I'll start. Okay, you're on, you start. I'll start, is I didn't get into my own practice earlier, yep. okay? 
Um, I didn't. I didn't. I had the safety net of the other people around me, and the the good part of that was I learned so much from everybody. But the bad part of it is I could have done so much more. So if you have um, any interest in starting your own firm, there's a, a seed that's in your mind. Just make sure you do it sooner. Do it like like Tally did it, or do it like Michelle did it. Um, you're gonna you're gonna like that. So that that was my mistake. Good. How about you, Tally? So I guess. Um, I guess I would have actually left my firm a little bit earlier. I know you were mentioning like, oh, you know, but I think I was feeling stagnant probably after, you know, three years. So I, I could have left a little earlier, but you know what? It wasn't the biggest mistake. It was just a learning experience. And I actually did learn a lot from my firm in terms of how to manage a firm because it was a small boutique firm. So I was happy about that. Um, but yeah, I always, and also just make sure that you, um, you know, you're flexible with your plans because sometimes things don't go as planned. But um, yeah, that's kind of what I, I So uh, we, I kind of went against, we went against things a lot of lawyers told us, you know, um, stick to the, your practice area. That's like the main thing. We took on one or two cases right at the beginning. They were great cases, but completely out of our practice area. So it drained so much of our time because we mm -hmm. had to learn how to do everything. Mm -hmm. Good value case, but we, within a couple of months, we we sat down. We're like, hey, we got to refer this out, and we actually on one of them we didn't even take a referral fee because we wanted the client to be taken care of, and we gave the case out. They were taken care of, and another one we worked out a deal. But just yeah, uh, you know, don't be afraid to say no is what a smart attorney once told me. Don't be afraid um, to say no. <laughs> <laughs> the power, you know, you're successful when you're the power to say no. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one big thing um, that we. You know you should stick to and we learned that right away is decide what you want to be as a firm write it down we want to be a lit we want to be a trial firm and that's what we set out to be which means you can't take any case um, you have a reputation out there if you know you're not going to take this case to trial don't take it don't look at the money it's really hard to stick with your plan it's really hard to say no but just stick with it um, and that's how you're going to build your reputation fast so that was my learning lesson don't go against your plan or Michelle, last word for you. Yeah, I, I would agree with that about saying no, but I would also say my biggest mistake was not pushing harder to try cases earlier. Um, it, I, well, I think I've tried 10 cases now, maybe 11, um, but it was really hard and really scary, and I didn't, I didn't pull the trigger. I, there was always a reason to settle or, or something, and I, you know, I definitely, there's a lot of cases out there I should have tried. Yeah. And when you're your own boss, who makes the call whether you try the case? Well, the client. Well, but the yeah. client. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's good. So the last one, we just say, well, did marketing, did this. Don't worry about that. Big human being, blah, blah, blah. Last one. <laughs> just do it. What are you waiting for? Who yeah. cares? Just go out and start your own firm. Everybody will help you. So uh, we're coming back for the keynote address in 10 minutes. Take a quick break. Everybody, thank our panelists for coming here today. Thank you. <laughs>